The gentleman yields back his time. With that, we go to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Laddermilk, is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the panel being here today. Um, Mr. Craddleville, um, as I understand it, the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act may not explicitly require financial institutions to comply with mandatory federal data security and breach notification requirements, but these requirements are essentially mandatory in practice. Can you explain um, how that, that happens? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. And yes, sir, I mean, I agree with you. Uh, they are mandatory. Uh, there is nothing about Graham Leach Bliley's security requirements or notice requirements that are treated as optional. Um, as I mentioned earlier to the chairman, uh, fundamentally, these are safety and soundness standards. They are treated as such for examination purposes. Examiners view compliance with both the security requirements and notice obligations as affirmative duties under safety and soundness regulations and the examiners themselves have a variety of enforcement tools at their disposal should they find a firm is not living up to either of those obligations. Okay, I appreciate that. I, I had my staff ask the Congressional Research Service and they, they advised of the same thing, so I just wanna make sure that we had a good understanding of that and I appreciate that. Mr. Miller, <clears throat> talk about the third party liability issue. I understand both sides of this, um, this debate and on one hand, understand the, and I appreciate the argument that the company that is breached should be responsible for the notification, but on the other hand, are we subjecting the consumers to even more, uh, or greater risk by transferring more data to an entity that was just breached? Um, I'm trying to, to find a, a, a good medium there. Can you comment on that? I just want to make sure I understand your, your question. You're, you're talking about transfers of more data to well, a third party because of the breach? Well, in a third party situation where there was a breach, but the third party may not have the contact information, mm -hmm. and if we require them to actually make the notification, are we not risking the consumer by even sending more data to that third party? And uh, absolutely. You know, particularly um, if the third party is the, is the, is the one who, who, who was breached, um, probably there are questions regarding security, so uh, sending a bunch of additional information to them seems, uh, you know, questionable. Yeah, and I, and I feel like, I mean, there is some liability there, but then we have that issue. I don't know if anybody else would like to comment on that. Um, if you have feelings, it's just one of those that the issues we're struggling with at this point of, of how do we resolve that if, if they were, the third party was actually the, the, the factor that caused the breach. I mean, I mean, if I, if I could just comment a little bit further sure. on, on the third party. I, I mean, it's true, that third parties, uh, I get if we look at uh, business arrangements, particularly of, of large companies across a variety of, of, of industries, they're using third parties for, for a variety of different purposes. Absolutely. Some of those third parties are small companies, some of those third parties are large companies are providing all different types of services. You know, there, there was one um, very, uh, uh, notorious breach a few years ago where a, a major company was breached through uh, a third party HVAC vendor, for instance. So, right. I, I mean, it, the most sensible way, it seems, to, to deal with the apportionment of liability in these types of scenarios is through contractual arrangements between the parties who are free to co contract with different parties if they'd like to choose different entities with which to work. And, and requiring strong security practices in your contracts is certainly something I would advise any okay. party to do. I appreciate that. This is one of the issues that we've, I've, I've been struggling with because I understand that there's some liability there, but also do you provide more information to, to the, the entity that was just breached? And dealing with inter information, I, I'll throw this out to anyone in the panel in the last few seconds we have. Um, are we collecting and maintaining too much data? Because we now, the more data you have, the more data we require through the government to be maintained, the more risky it is when, if you don't have, you don't have to protect what you don't have. Anyone want to comment on, are we collecting and maintaining too much data? Um, I, think, I think your point is, is well stated. If you don't have it, you've automatically reduced the, um, the risks to your company. Um, 
you know, I, I can't speak to, you know, I'm, I'm, I know that is extremely valuable to businesses and it's, it provides benefits to consumers for those businesses to have that data. However, we do see a lot of companies collecting data that uh, is very sensitive for consumers without having a present need for it um, or holding on to data for uh, years and years and years when they're not using it. So I, I do think that is part of the, the concern. Um, good practice, data management practices would reduce the amount of data that you're not using that you don't have. Well, I appreciate that, and I think that would expand also to our government as well. Very briefly, I was just going to make that same point. This is a problem across the economy in both public and private sectors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. With that, we go.